I used to be a frugal gamer like you until I bought Skyrim again. Well, hello there, and welcome to Triangle Square, the PlayStation podcast. I'm your host, Brett Beck, and alongside me, as always, is Mr. Saw Bridges, bringing you guys lucky episode 236. And along next to me is... Uh, Chris Figs. <laughs> I, I didn't get a mister. I was waiting for my cue. <laughs> oh. Did you say a Chris Figs? A Chris Figs. A Chris well, Figs. Like, oh, right. <laughs> Also, Saul, I don't know how much you paid attention, but pretty much the entire time that you were out with your blood clot, at the end of the intro, Chris or I would do chong and line it up to the, and I would always have it in the audio uh-uh. layered underneath the intro. Nuh-uh. For, for funsies. Chong. Like chong. PlayStation. Yeah. So, no, it's almost like that's why it's in the theme song. The PlayStation dong. Or the, I mean, <laughs> the PlayStation. Call. The long dong of PlayStation. <laughs> It's clearly a chong, <laughs> not, not a dong. Is it a chong? I feel like that's wrong terminology too. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> oh, the- <laughs> look, <laughs> this is onomatopoeia, right? Isn't that where it's it's spelled out the way that it sounds? Yes. Okay, like, so this is like literally kabam. we're calling it chong because that's what it sounds like. Chong. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're new to the show. <laughs> You can watch on YouTube or listen on podcast services. And if you do so, feel free to like, subscribe, uh, give us a review on uh, any of the podcast services that we're on that lets listeners know whether or not the show is of value. Uh, And you are the only person that can really help determine that and get it out there in front of people's faces. So we thank all of you who have all who've done that. We've had plenty of people who have. But we like to start this show off the right way. And that is very simple. What have you been playing this week, Solomon? Ooh, um, I've been playing uh, Dark Souls 3. <laughs> and Which, a little bit of something else. Yes. Um, so I have been working on um, my Platinum for Dark Souls 3. As sh- Also, shout out to Awesome Dave in our Discord which uh, you can find linked in our description below. But uh, Awesome Dave responded in our podcast open discussion um, thread of, that he, uh, he says, after listening to last week's show, I had the urge to install Dark Souls 3 again and try to ground out the last rings and spells for the Platinum. Got to get ready for Elden Ring. And that's what I'm doing. I am I'm grinding out the rings first. That's going to be the, the most tedious part. And I worked on it not all day yesterday, for, but for about five hours yesterday, I would say. Um, I pretty much built a pretty overpowered character like I normally do and blasted through the base game, all the bosses, and then the DLC of all the bosses. And before starting New Game Plus, I went through and I capped off all the rings that I could get that I wasn't already messed up with um, uh, because of side quests that I messed up on. But to my understanding, like all the rings that you get in side quests, you could do those at any given point, at any given playthrough. So I'm not really worried about those. Okay, so I was always wondering if there were side quests in specific New Game Pluses. Like there's on- this side quest only exists in New Game Plus 4. Not to my knowledge, no. That doesn't happen, uh, at least with Dark Souls 3. I don't think that happens in any Dark Souls game, but I don't normally do. I normally do the side quest the first time around. Like, I've only ever done um, <coughs> Sigmire. Wait, was it Sigward? It's one Sigmire? of the two. Sig- Sigmire. Sid Meier's and Squidward is just what I heard. <laughs> Sigward and uh, Sigmire. Um, they interchange between Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 3. They're two different people, but they're homages, um, or one's an homage. I did his quest when the game first came out. With the whole like him getting his armor sold by patches and then getting armor back from patches by buying it and then giving it back to him, uh, I did that quest once and I've not done it since. But I can show Brett my list here. This is all the rings that I had and I've check marked almost all of them off, but like five. Okay, for and that's, just for playthrough one, right? That's just for playthrough one, yeah. But granted, the other the other like new game rings, it's not that bad. You know, no missing. surprise that the new game's called Elden Ring because clearly there is a There's exception a rings. with rings in these games. I don't understand it. But I think that this is where this gets easy is that all these new game plus rings are all just in the world. Okay. So I think um so like I think at that point I could just go through and get them and check them off. Like I did all these rings. So yeah. All, all the rings here that aren't check marked are from Covenant Rewards which could be done at any time, or side quest. So for the New Game Plus ones you were talking about, because I've never really... I've, I've gotten into New Game Plus on Bloodborne. I think that's the only one I've actually New Game Plus onto. Mm-hmm. Uh, I normally play these games and then I'm done with them, which is fine for me. But does New Game Plus actually change the items that spawn into the world? Yes. Okay. So like... Uh, does it change the spawn order of all things or does it just add new things? 
it's a bit of both. So for an instance, um, all the souls are upgraded because you're at New Game Plus. All your all the bosses when you kill them, you get more souls because oh, you're okay. New Game Plus. It's, yeah, sure. Your skull, your uh, experience scales with the difficulty. Yeah, and, because, and for them to even be useful, you'd actually have to get way more out of them. So I went into New Game Plus at like level 105, and uh, because of that, like if I killed like Idux Gundir, I got like 30,000 souls instead of like the 2,000 he gives you on your first time around. Sure. Yeah. Um, but like an example is, is like in that first tutorial area, there's a path that you can take and go fight a big crystal beast um, yes. in Dark mm-hmm. Souls 3. Yeah. Well, there is the crystal beast soul there. There's the shiny there. That's the like a paladin soul instead of just a large soul of the undead. But then there's a new ring that's over there too. That's okay. just in the world. That's just a new shiny on the ground. Which is interesting because, you know, normally in New Game Plus in games, I feel like it's moving through them quicker. It is kind of interesting to be like, you have to explore just as much if you want to actually find all these items to get the platinum. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. you actually do have to do some fair more exploring around, which I actually had to do for some of the rings. Like for this, there's some of these rings I've never gotten before, which is interesting because it led me to areas I've never found before. So, which is, you know, there's like this one, there was one ring that's in the Arch Dragon Peak, the hidden area where the boss, the... Gwen's firstborn is. Yeah. Um, that's around like a corner on a ledge. I never knew that that ledge was there because I never paid a close attention that you could walk on this little plank that jutted off to the side that led down this little area. Granted, it's like a little alleyway. It's not like a lot at all of an area. See, but it's such it's so small, but it's so interesting. Now, I didn't know that was there either. But what makes that so weird to me is that there are games where I feel like exploration like that is somewhat like... You, it's, I'm not saying not rewarded because clearly it's rewarded here. Yeah. But... I don't feel like it leads you to explore in the same way because if if when you look at a plank hanging off the side, I would not my first thought would not be, let me walk on that plank real quick and see if I can walk on it. Because the moment that you die, I just lose all I, I lose all the souls I had. And it's like I feel like the punishment for death in this game makes me more cautious when it comes to things like that, where I'm like, I don't want to lose the progress I've made with these souls. By exploring. Yeah. <clears throat> um, which is crazy too, because by exploring is almost the often way to unlock shortcuts. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, I do that to a degree, but if you're going to make odd ones like that, it almost seems like the whole idea is to kind of have you be like, I don't think I can do this. And then I guess it's just whether it's it's kind of like it reminds me of the one in Bloodborne when you've got to jump out of the elevator going up to the tower before you get to, um, I think it's Margot's Wet Nurse, uh, where you jump out to get the blood chunk. Oh, the blood. Yeah, that's... Um or the it's bloodstone chunk, whatever it's called. It is on the way up to Margaret's wet nurse. Yeah, it's it. It is the you blood. You jump out of the elevator well, that, through a hole, which leads you to a hidden area. That's for the blood rock. That's like the, the rock, last. the biggest. Yeah, one. That's yeah, the the last, one. Yeah, that's the last. Uh, that's the titanite slab of the series. Mm-hmm. Um, which yeah. is the same thing. I wouldn't even if I saw that hole in the wall. My first thought wouldn't be I could probably jump out of that and go somewhere secret. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. So I, I'm having a good time with it. I, will I continue to get the platinum? It just depends on how tedious it gets. Um, the rings, I don't think are going to be that hard. I think it's just going to require time. I think that uh, other parts of the game, like all miracles and stuff like that, that might be a little tedious. But um, sure. other than that... Well, the other game you've been playing was Dark Souls 2D. Yeah, Dark Souls 2D. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Other than that, I've been playing Death's Gambit Afterlife on Switch. And I don't know if you remembered, but me and Brett loved Death's Gambit when it first came out. And I've been having a blast with this game, even though I've only played it for like four hours total. But it is so good, and I, and <clears throat> I applaud. Uh, it's not Team Cherry. That's it's like Knight. White Rabbit. It is White Rabbit. Yeah, um, White Rabbit for like the the optimization they made because the game had launched, it had problems. It there was a part on me where I couldn't get past. I couldn't progress it at all. And they're a very small team, definitely and, back then, because yeah. that's an Adult Swim's game. Like, yeah. that's that's the interesting thing as Adult Swim games. And I I enjoyed it so much that like I I was sad that I couldn't progress. It was in a certain area, and I knew that it would fix it eventually. And I wanted to wait on it. And then when I heard Afterlife was a thing, I just waited even more until now. And it just came out like a couple months ago or like last month. And I've been really enjoying it. So that's that's what I've been playing this week, more so towards the end of these last two days. Chris, what have you been playing? Um, <clears throat> I got the Platinum and Guardians of the Galaxy finally, so that's Woo. done. Great game. Woo woo. Um, I am you almost done Juggalo with thing. the Juggalo call. Woo woo. Yeah, I, you know what, man? <laughs> really not sure. Got to be honest. With you. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not either. But I, <laughs> I think don't that know is. If I'm the target audience. Um, <laughs> and then I've been. I finished Spec Ops: The Line. I'm playing through it again on the Fubar difficulty. Dude, what Which, a game. That game's yeah, good. It's incredible stuff. The ending is great. 
You, the whole thing you is said great, it the but... exact way, right? Because I remember I played Spec Ops down the line when it got free on PS Plus. I didn't play it yeah. right at launch or anything. Um, and even then, it was one of those games where I downloaded it and added it to my thing, but didn't play it for like another year after we got it for mm-hmm. free. So I was way late to the party. And that kind of tells me that even at launch, the gameplay is not excellent. It's no. okay. It's standard it, fair. Yeah, and it moves you along for the thing that actually starts to grip you and make you want to continue playing, which is the very interesting choice of story. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, once you start shooting off mortars, if you know what I'm talking about, (laughs) to avoid spoiling this 10-year-old game. Um, Dude, that 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 reveal, that reveal scene? Yeah. The the (laughs) person with and their kid, it's like, Jesus Christ. That's like dread embodied. Yeah. Ugh. That game is heavy. <laughs> it is heavy. Um, I think my yeah. I don't really have many issues with it. I love it. Um, the Fubar difficulty is very hard. Yeah. Um, but I'm uh, through chapter six, so I'll probably get that done in my nice week off. Okay. Uh, and then I've just been checking out some VR stuff. Back into Walking Dead, playing some Beat Saber. Uh, I tried the Persistence. So yeah, it's been a nice smorgasbord of stuff this week. So how's the Persistence? Have you played much? Uh, I played through the tutorial, did some combat. It's fine. I don't know. I kind of wish it was a move game. That's my oh, is one it problem not? With it. No, it's oh, well, hold on. Only. But it, it's a shooter game, right? Yeah. Are you yeah. sure it's shooter? Are you sure it's controller only, or does it support the aim controller? It's controller only. Ugh. I would be very surprised though, because one of the benefits that the aim controller has over the normal move controllers is two analog sticks. So literally, you get to all the buttons that you have on a controller. I would be very surprised if they wouldn't choose to update it to work with that. So I'm checking. I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. We're gonna find out. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't. I don't. It doesn't say anything. I. I just remember. I. Ha- I expected to play with my move controllers, and it told me to play with a. Uh, yeah, it says still no motion controller support on the Steam thing. So, dude, that sucks. Yeah, because I was <laughs> expecting it to. I was expecting it to be that, and it wasn't. And I don't know. I don't really like playing <laughs> VR games with just a controller, but. S- See, I thought it was interesting because you were talking about eyeing uh, a, a DualShock 4 since you're on PS5 now and you don't have one anymore. That yeah. you were eyeing a DualShock 4 so you could play Hitman 3 in VR. And I've got to be honest, I don't even know that I'd want to with a controller if I'm being dead. I, to me, I think that it's weird to go the extra route of being like, hey, we're going to make this game VR supported and then take away literally how you interact with the VR world. Why would I want to be able to move my head around and perfectly see everything and then not be able to actually move hands around and touch things or have a gun that moves with how I'm moving? It breaks the immersion and it kind of, to me, is like, what's the point of VR if you're not going to try to immerse me? I guess it does break the immersion, but I have no interest in playing Hitman with motion controllers. (laughs) Not a single... I have... I would have zero to do it with motion controllers on PlayStation VR. The motion controllers as they work for like the Oculus Quest 2 that I have now, totally. Because it has every button, analog sticks. Because did you ever play Skyrim VR? Not yet, no. Okay. The biggest problem it has, and I'm glad that they moved away from only having a teleport option for that game. But the problem that it had is that even though they eventually added free movement, do you know how you moved? You had to hold the move button and then on, on one arm and raise your arm slightly forward and you'd walk forward or you could swing it slightly back and it would move you back. And then on the other hand, because there's no analog sticks, to yeah. move the camera, you had to like hold the move controller, move button with the other hand and kind of like move oh, your hand. It was the worst. It's terrible. That's terrible because Walking Dead, you just hold the middle button and then you use the face buttons on the other one, it'll turn the camera and that's how you walk. And you can well, kind of so like, people. you ahead. can kind of like do this and it'll move you around and like turn. But like the way I usually do it is with the buttons <clears throat> and it works really well. Um, I don't know. Well, Hitman is more of like, I just want to see it, <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't know, maybe, but I think, well, I guess because Hitman moves from a third person perspective to a first, right? Yeah. Well, but like, I, I don't know. It seems like a lot to be trying to like, do a silent assassin run in VR and be like, oh, I, I have to figure out how to garrot this guy. And that just, I'd rather just hit a button and like kind of just well, see. I, and I understand that, but I guess, yeah, I guess. I think the biggest thing is options to a degree. I mean, I guess if you really want that, it's just an, there's no reason you can't have a DualShock 4, but you should, that should be 
underneath the opposite of also being able to play these games with full, you know, full support. But the, you know, I kind of told you that the biggest problem because I'll kind of go ahead and say I've been playing Quest um, VR, so I've been doing Air Link and trying that out and playing VR on PC and VR from um, from the headset itself and doing different things. And the tracking is is worlds apart on that, and it's to the point where like. I already had issues with PSVR towards the end of my runs with it when I was like, certain games work well with it, right? I think Job Simulator works perfectly for the limitations of PSVR. But if you were going to look at me right now and say, hey, let's do Resident Evil 4 VR in the same way that this did on Quest 2, but in PSVR, it would play like ass. <laughs> and I just, I'd have zero interest because. You know, you're moving to a first person viewpoint. You're actually having to like pick up your, and, and it makes it way more fun, but you pick up your clip and you slide it into the gun and you have to rack your gun and then actually cock it back and shoot. And it makes the game harder, but it also makes it feel like it needs to be in VR at that point. Whereas I don't really have interest to do the other side. So VR is a real weird thing. And I'm really hoping to see, which I'm glad to see. We've already known what the controllers look like for PSVR 2, as we're going to call it right now. Mm. Uh, and they look significantly better. So. Yeah, it's fun. Um, I don't know. VR is cool. I just can't see myself finishing anything really in it. And see, the, the I think the game I put me. the absolute most time into, like Moss was good. I finished it on there. But in terms of like 50 hours into a game, I think one of the only games I put really that kind of time into was Firewall Zero Hour, which is an excellent game. It's so good. Yeah, I do but, want to try that one. You know, it's it's still weighed down by the same issues. You know, I would love to play Firewall Zero Hour on Quest Two, which goes to say the importance of exclusives. Because the only thing that might draw me back is if I had a group of friends that were like, "Let's all play Firewall," and I yeah. might be like, "Damn, okay, let's do it." You know, <laughs> and because the VR aim controller literally fixes half of the problems with PSVR's tracking because you have analog sticks and, and whatnot. You know, um, so it's it's interesting, but I'm. I think VR is still in that little weird place where depending on the version you play, it feels more nascent than other versions of it do, right? Mm -hmm. Which PSVR is six-year-old tech at this point. Yeah, so, I mean, it's like I said, if I, I, I'm glad I don't know what it's like to play better VR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good place to be. <laughs> so, did you play anything else? So that just pretty much been it. VR no, um, and Guardian? Just the new season of Apex. It's great. You should play Apex. <laughs> also, I did not mean... I, I saw way later, and I was like, I've already gone this long without replying. Might as well yeah, just not reply. Insulting. Yeah, Chris <laughs> sends me a message. Or he sends a message in the little private Discord thing we have, and it's like, Brett, download Apex for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely... If it makes you feel better, I spent most of yesterday working on my house next door and doing a bunch of wiring and stuff, so I just wasn't on my phone. Yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Ignore me. It's totally cool. <laughs> yeah, it's cool, man. No problems. All right, man. Um, yeah, I uh, I played Guardians. I beat Guardians. I'm working toward the Platinum. And I, I had this conversation with Chris. I think Guardians is such a good game. There's so many things I like about it. There's a couple of things that are rough, like context uh, issues where I think that they didn't put enough thought and there are unused buttons elsewhere that I could have been like, hey, move this elsewhere so I don't have to worry about smacking the wrong thing. Um the huddle is actually the thing that comes to mind. I cannot stand mm -hmm. the huddles L1 and R1 because mm -hmm. I'll be trying to hit R1 to do my elemental shot and then I'll hold L1 to try and send a request, but I didn't get off of R1 quick enough and then it goes into a huddle I didn't want to do. Yep. And yep. I hated that. Um, dude, to, to the degree where I didn't even care about the huddle system that much, almost every huddle I did in the game was accidental. Yeah, I, I didn't really use it. I would save it. But then I would do what, exactly what you're talking about. And like, oh, there's one enemy left and I just want Drax to kill it. And then, oh, no, we've huddled for this one guy who's halfway dead. Cool. Yep. And it <laughs> happened to me a ton of times. I will say, though, it did lead me to a, a very fun moment that I actually did the PlayStation save clip phone on because we did the huddle on accident. And then uh, I was like, fine, we're going to do it. I, I did the huddle correctly like I was supposed to. And then as soon as we left out, it started playing, wake me up before yeah. you go, go. While I'm just over there slaying enemies. And I had, it, it was perfectly timed where as soon as the huddle was going, there was a bunch of context things where I could like hit triangle and it was doing the real cool camera flares. And I yeah. just felt like I was watching almost like a movie play out of, of the Guardians slaying a bunch of people to the, the fun tunes of wake me up before you go, go. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's so. the best. That's the best part of the huddle, and I almost wish they hadn't said it there because it kind of hides that music stuff. And I wish battles just had the music. That would be way better to me. The, honestly, it would. Like, have it be that I, um, uh, Star Lord's character trait basically is that he always wants to make sure he's got his tunes blaring. And you could even make it where it's like the guardian, the other guardians can't hear it, but he can. And since you're playing the game through his lens make it to where every time he's going in you can hear him click the button and you hear yeah. a little tape reel for like a split second and then you hear the music start that'd be awesome it would because he has headphones like in the game he has headphones yeah. so just wear them yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that game's been really well uh the, the one problem i had with it on a bigger thing is i'm not a big fan of trophy design that kind of messes around with second playthrough stuff where this is where I'm going to give it a great thing. I have that 90% trophies just from my own general curiosity and something that Chris always is like, why don't you just do it? I never look at trophy lists before I play a game. And without any trophy help at all, I got to 90% But when I beat the game. Uh, and then the couple that I had, I missed like three or four costumes. And I started going in and all the trophy guides are wrong, by the way. They say you can't go chapter select and get the costumes. You absolutely can, but there's a caveat there. You, you have can't to do the other the chapter. One. Sorry. Well, you have to, yeah, you have to play the chapter that the missing costumes in. You have to get the costume, and then you have to beat the costume for it to save and add into your compendium. If you Mm -hmm. don't beat and you just exit out as soon as you get the costume, it does not stay. And I think that's what they were doing is they were trying to go in and do it that way. It does not work. So I had to replay like three or four chapters. Um, Thankfully, even though all everything said otherwise, Chris kind of. Gave me the the spirit to try it out and move on, and it worked. Yeah, um, I was like, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but there's another trophy that if I wouldn't have been lucky that I got it on first playthrough, I absolutely would have just had to play the game again. And it's getting 65% of the compendium filled out. And uh, if you miss, the, you don't have to miss very much from when I started looking at the trophy guide yesterday after we talked, Chris. Mm-hmm. You don't have to miss very much at all for that 65% to not be hit. Like yeah. You can miss a couple of items that are... I mean, clearly, it's, there's 100%. There's plenty of items, but... You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. So, I've been enjoying that, though. Um, and then, of course, playing Resident Evil 4 VR has been fun. I'm not super far. The game, like I said, is far more difficult because instead of being in a, a third-person thing where you, you can move around and reload with the touch of a button, it is like every time you run out of ammo and you see that, you have to do all this work to rack your gun. And it's heart-pounding and really fun. But it's it's good. Uh, Chris, eventually, I want you to try Quest 2 just because. If you end up coming uh, coming down beginning of the year like we talked about, just be prepared to how different they are. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to. Make sure you play everything on PSVR that you wanted to before then. <laughs> yeah, I'll binge VR just so I don't get ruined on it. <laughs> well, i got two weeks till the trip. All right, the next two weeks are dedicated VR games. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but man, I think we're going to go ahead and move in to the news. But remember, if you want to be part of our community's take section that we do after the news every section, you can head over to our social media and give us a follow. We're on Triangle or at Triangle SQRD on Twitter. On Facebook, you can find us in the group Triangle Square to PlayStation Podcast. Or you can always link down below in the description to jump into the Discord where we have a dedicated section for that. Uh, and this week's was interesting because we kind of had to come off of it off the top of the dome. And I think it worked out. We got a lot of interesting answers. So, uh, and some fun discussions. But the news for this week, there's big news, but not a lot of it. So, we're going to start off. The first thing is after its official reveal, the wording of Bethesda Skyrim Anniversary Edition led many to believe, including me at the time, not believe, but I was definitely like, this is weird wording that the game might not offer an upgrade path from the Skyrim Special Edition that they released on PS4 and Xbox One uh, earlier this generation, or last generation. Uh, but that's to have taken to their site to clarify the upgrade process, the price, and more. So the first thing up, owners of Skyrim Special Edition can upgrade to the Anniversary Edition for $20. Uh, while non-upgrade purchasers uh, will be looking at a forty-nine ninety-nine price point. Next thing up, they confirm that even Skyrim Special Edition will be getting the next-gen upgrade for free that optimizes the game with improved graphics, load times, and, quote, more. The more is involved in a second. Without having to buy or upgrade to Anniversary Edition. So instead, if you're on PS5 and you don't feel like buying Anniversary Edition, your Special Edition will still see these upgrades. That's actually pretty cool. Um 
Special edition users will also be getting four of the Creation Club editions for free, including Saints and Seducers, which is an additional storyline that originally released back in 2019. But it comes with two main quests, side quests, new enemies, and new gear. Uh, there's Rare Curios, uh, which is imported goods from all over Tamriel that can be bought from Khajiit Caravans to create new items and potions and whatnot. There's Survival Mode, which adds temperature control where you have to make sure that you're character is not freezing to death uh hunger and exhaustion to the game and fishing which was shown off during the reveal and highly hinted at that fishing would be part of anniversary edition it is not it's free for everyone uh so anniversary edition gives access to the remaining wide swath of creations including newly created ones that delve into morrowind's gear and lore and stopping the mythic dawn from creating a new oblivion gate uh, which is pretty cool because apparently there's a summonable Daedric horse that you can get as part of this. And that's pretty cool. I'm all down for that. So, um, lastly, trophies do not carry over when moving from PS4 version of the anniversary edition to the PS5 version. But if you move from the PS4 version of special edition to the PS4 version of anniversary edition, they do transfer. Um, so the game releases on November 11th. We're just a few days away. Uh, Chris, are you excited about being able to re platinum Skyrim? Yes. I'm going to see if I can beat my 40 hours because 40 hours is already a significantly yeah. short platinum time. So I want, I want to tell you how excited I am to re platinum Skyrim. I've also bought it on PS3. I just <laughs> ordered that off eBay today for five bucks. Here's, so. here's your biggest problem. So you're, uh, you're going to platinum it on PS3? Yeah, platinum all of it. Then I'll do Skyrim VR. Then I'll. I have suck, actually suck thought about it. <laughs> it, it. Skyrim VR played better because look there's this thing I don't know if you ever remember seeing it the PSVR um, it was called like the rudder or something you put it under your feet and that's the solution to Skyrim VR yeah it supports that game and if you tilt it forward with your feet you move forward if you tilt it to the side you like strafe if you do the other side or if you go back you go back and I think you can spin it and it'll spin your character a little bit if I bought one of those they're extremely expensive but if I bought oh, one man. of those and then did that. I could see myself going back in because Skyrim VR was fun whenever you yeah. were getting over the fact that it was terrible to control. It was really <laughs> cool. And it's like, dude, doing this in VR is kind of sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was thinking about getting Skyrim VR on PC. I think it's on PC. It's not on Oculus Quest by itself, but playing uh, playing a better tracked version of it because that game could be very cool in VR. Uh, but yeah, be, be careful because I don't have the PS3 Platinum because of the Daedric Artifacts glitch like crazy in the PS3 version. Which yeah, means no, you have I've to heard. start a new playthrough in order to do that. So, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, it was, it was more you. to put on my shelf, but I was like, yeah, five bucks, you know, whatever. I'll give it a shot. Play Skyrim, out. PS4, Skyrim, PS4, Skyrim, PS4, Skyrim, PS5, and Skyrim, PS5, <laughs> and Skyrim, PS3. <laughs> so... I'm, I'm glad that this happened this way because, um, I mean, like I said, the wording was just poor before to the point where it felt like they were going to have it be where you just had to buy it. And if that's what they wanted to do, that's what they wanted to do. But you weren't going to get me in there. I'm glad to hear that Chris is going to buy the $20 one because I probably wasn't going to do that either. <laughs> but I'll do I'll, I'll play all the content that gets added um, when you're I buying would, it. But I'd I be would, more likely to buy it at 20 than 50 Yeah, 20 is a good price. I wasn't Plenty, excited yeah. about this until I realized it was coming out next week, and I was like, "Oh no, I'm really excited." <laughs> oh no, why? <laughs> <laughs> it happens, man. Skyrim's a game that you want to bemoan the fact that it constantly gets re-released, but it is a good game. It's so you're awesome. like you're you, yeah, you're you're stuck in this area between like like I don't want to want to play it, but, but I, I kind of want to play it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the, it's the game that keeps playable. on giving. It really is. It's a yeah. fun game. So, uh, next thing up, Square Enix in their most recent quarterly financial report have stated that Marvel's Avengers has, as many of us know, not performed to expectation, but recognize that Crystal Dynamics was not the right fit for the game. As a notable single player developer, Square feels this experience can help them better select game designs that, quote, mesh with the unique attributes and taste, end quote, of their studios. Uh, they rounded off this by stating that their certainty that games as a service approach will continue to grow in gaming as in their words, gaming becomes more service, uh, service oriented, uh, which is interesting. I think that there is a really interesting conversation about the way that Marvel's Avengers Avengers was handled and how it's continued to be handled. And I think square has a lot to learn here because does square really have a lot of games as a service that aren't just like their MMO team. Realistically speaking, I can't I think of very many, if, if any at so. all. 
Because the only thing that came no. to my head for some reason was the division, and that's definitely not them. So, well, I think what's interesting about that is that Square actually the entire last gen made almost every bit of crazy money they made off of the back of long running JRPG series. Like they made a good bit of money off of Dragon Quest Eleven. They made a Kingdom Hearts three sold better than any Kingdom Hearts ever has. Final Fantasy fifteen sold better than most Final Fantasies. Final Fantasy seven remake sold better than most Final Fantasies. Uh, and it seems like for all that the all the work they've done and all the releases they've done for their um, American and European, you know, their Western studio branches, their Western studios have just been a consistent thing of not quite performing as well as what is probably presumably cheaper uh, from their Japanese studios um, <clears throat> outside of eh, who knows with how long the games take to make in Japan, but they, but they sell crazy. Um, so it'd be interesting to see square come back around to games as a service. So I hope that that doesn't mean they're trying to do the um, Ubisoft gate thing where all of their studios are just going to work on games as a service moving forward. They haven't quite said that, but it, they've basically hinted at it. Um, Chris, I know yes, that sir. you did not care for Avengers and like it. What are you? No, it's terrible. Um, they're right. They should have canceled it. I don't know. Like they just made the, a bad game. I don't really know how else to put it. Like I don't. I don't know why Crystal Dynamics was the one doing this. I don't know why you thought let's make an Avengers game, but make it an MMO ish thing, and then not even really commit to the idea of it. I don't know. It's just all around a really weird decision especially now what having guardians in the rearview mirror it's like what did, what were you doing why yeah if, and guardians is a perfect example because Eidos is also mm-hmm. known for being very story driven and this is an excellent use of their talents what's interesting to me is that guardians would have worked better for me as a live service not in terms of like the game itself would have been better but if you sold me Guardians of the Galaxy took the place of Avengers and Avengers was a single player game, that makes significantly more sense because at least with the Guardians, you can do unlimited planets you can go to. You can add all these cosmic characters. There's these cosmic battles. And the lore of the story and, right. and world around it supports that. Yeah. Yeah, Same. it makes a lot more sense. And why why did you do this with the Avengers? You know, if you were going to do this, you should have picked the right property. And I feel like this was one of those things where they announced it right as the movies were coming out. And then they delayed it so much that the Avengers hype train is kind of over. And it's like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, I just don't get it. <laughs> Fair enough. I think the weird thing here is and something that's said in here that makes me really wonder is this idea of... The there's a line in here that says <laughs> better select game designs that mesh with the unique attributes. So my question kind of here is uh, the idea that are are they choosing or let me say this is Square in a position where in this world and in this scenario Square either got told by Disney, hey, we want a game as a service that's you know, or for Marvel, we want a games as a service Marvel game, uh, or were was it Square being like, "Hey, we want a games as a service game. We've got to deal with Marvel. Let's do one here, um, and let's kind of just use this as the idea of like, oh, okay, here we are. We're gonna go around our developers and just pick which one we want to make this. I hope that that's not the situation, but it definitely moves away from what I thought games were kind of done, at least I, the ideal situation for development, which is that I would imagine that, a, that Crystal Dynamics would have been a, a, a studio that got told that this was an opportunity and they pa- they pa- uh, pitched this idea and Square were like, we're going to let you try it. But it sounds to me like it's Square saying that they could have given this exact game design to somebody else, which makes it sound like the game design wasn't necessarily Crystal's. Yeah. I don't know. the And it's the wording of how they went about saying all this that kind of got me because it just doesn't feel like what I would expect. You know, we always hear about Sony being like, you come and you pitch something to us and we either green light it or we don't. I don't think there'd be a situation where Sony would be like, one studio would come up to them and be like, hey, let's make a new Twisted Metal. And they're like, mm, okay, give us your pitch. And then they go, that pitch is great, but it doesn't fit you. So instead we're going to give it to this studio. I hope that doesn't happen because that just sounds like a weird idea to let someone create the pitch behind something and then be like, okay, but you're not going to do it. 
Yeah, it, that doesn't make much sense. I could see it as like a, I don't know, like a, I, I guess, yeah, no, it doesn't make sense. Because I was thinking of more like a consulting kind of thing where it's like, yeah, we came up with this pitch and we'd love your st- one of your studios to do it. But otherwise, yeah. Well, see, that's what I'm wondering if that's what it was. Because from the Marvel side of things, we've heard this thing where like Marvel and Sony got together and, and everyone assumed that Insomniac got to do Spider-Man specifically because Spider-Man was the only one that Sony got given, no. moved to. But then later the story came out that uh, Insomniac confirmed that Sony just came up to them, said, hey, we're working out a deal with Marvel. Is there a is there a Marvel franchise that you would like to make a game of? And they chose Spider Man out of that. And if that's how this is being handled by Marvel and at least Sony, I think Sony's doing the right thing here. Go to your studios and be like, hey, out of out of these franchises, which one would you like to dip your toes into and make a game out of? And I would hope that Square's answer is to not have a, a boardroom full of members be like, what games do we not have that are popping in the market right now? Games as a service. Mm, yes. Okay. What's popping in pop culture right now? The Avengers. Great. We've been on the phone with Marvel. So we're going to make a Marvel's game, uh, a Marvel's Avengers game as a service game. You know what? Give it to Crystal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know right? what I mean? It, I, don't hope, I hope that that was not the situation. But the wording here is very interesting. So I don't know. It's it also seems really weird that they threw them under the bus. Like this was your fault in a lot of ways. <sighs> this is weird because I I do feel like it 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 comes off that way, but at the same time, I think it's Square actually kind of admitting that it's on them just as much as it's on anybody. Like that, it, it it's still odd wording all the way around, but it is kind of them being like, we chose the wrong studio for this. This was not the right idea, and we need to learn lessons from this if we're going to keep trying to make games as a service type games. Because clearly they got a lot of lessons to learn. But enough of that. Uh, next thing up, after being shown off in 2019, both Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2 have been officially delayed. Pandemic strains on development, legal and work environment troubles within the company. And with those, the departure of many higher ups on the teams building these games, including each game's director. It's no surprise these games are getting delayed. More so... Their wording seems to imply that these two titles will miss 2022 as well, with Blizzard saying, quote, while we are still planning to deliver a substantial amount of content from Blizzard next year, we are now planning for a later launch for Overwatch 2 and Diablo 4 than originally envisaged, end quote. Um, which is really interesting, mainly because I think this goes towards showing this is one of the many concerns and issues behind being so eager about showing your games too early i don't know why we needed to see either of these games and i know that there's been a ton of complications but I, why did i you can tell me you're working on diablo 4 but why did you go through and show me the game in action and verticality and these new character builds none of that needed to be said you could just kingdom hearts 3 it and say we're working on kingdom hearts 3 yeah like it's in development now here's a little teaser video and that's it. Instead, they showed gameplay and all this stuff, and it leads you to this expectation. And we always talk about, right, this idea of you should be careful with your expectations, but sometimes your expectations are set very much by what's being shown to you. And if you would have told me, I thought that Blizzard uh, would have released Diablo 2 by early 2021 when they showed it in 2019 and said, well, we're not quite ready. That's what that felt like. Okay, we're probably like a year and a half out, but no, not even remotely. Um it is what it is at this point. <laughs> I don't understand. For one, I don't understand why there's an Overwatch 2. As someone who's played a lot of Overwatch, doesn't make any sense. It's just a campaign. Dude, so just it's put exactly it the question behind me of why was there a need for a Destiny 2. This sounds well, like this Because is they worked Activision. with Activision. Yeah. Exactly. And this is Activision Blizzard. So um, here we are. I just, but the, the thing, and I've said this about Pokemon, not to go on a tangent but with this it's like release a 60 dollar campaign add-on and here's 60 bucks you get the campaign two characters five maps whatever it is fine people would pay for that because people pay for destiny seasons every year people Mm -hmm. pay for destiny dungeons every year you know why did you do that instead you're like here's overwatch 2 it's going to be the exact same multiplayer but there's a campaign that just seems insulting, first of all, to your to your audience. Like, I don't get it. And it would seem to me that development would be easier if you just stick within the engine you have. I mean, I guess the only benefit you have from there is that you get to do engine improvements on a game that's not live. And you get to technically move your technical aspects up to where going into PS5, you have a PS5 version. 
uh, and and you have better tech that's behind that because now this is a next gen game. Whereas no matter what you do, you were kind of seeing this with uh, Call of Duty Warzone. And I mm-hmm. guess to a degree, Apex and stuff too, where if, if I'm not mistaken, at least I know with Call of Duty Warzone, it's still just a PS4 version of the game. It yeah. recognizes that you're on a PS5, but it's not a <laughs> bulk version because the tech is old and they just, they're like, and eh, we're just going to keep building on top of it rather than changing well, it I, out. And Apex, I think that that's part of it. You have tech debt to a degree. I guess, but Apex is coming out on PS5 this year, they said. Okay, so know. Apex is also not a bespoke version yet. Not yet, but I can tell you how much left for this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, next year. Um, did I always oh, say this, this year? year. No, that's my fault. I think yeah, I, did. I thought you yeah, did. Next year, next yeah. year, twenty twenty two. Um, but I can tell you that Apex does not recognize that you're on a PS five because I had they had a ninety gig update, so I was like, all right, I'm not keeping this on my SSD anymore. Put it on my my external. Haven't noticed a difference. Nothing different. So. I've been tricking myself for almost a year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's unfortunate. I mean, what are you going to do, though? I mean, it's weird because I think that's the biggest thing that live service games face is this idea that whenever it comes time to cross over into a new realm, it's hard to take down. And then your other option is to do something that doesn't make sense from the way the game is built, which is to just make a two to be like, OK, we're going to call this Apex 2 and we have an entirely new engine. The gameplay of the multiplayer is very similar, but smoother. Supports this feature, this feature, increased lo- uh, draw distances and better animation suite, all because of this new engine. But that feels at odds with the idea of how Apex has been built this entire time. You know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll MMOs see. MMOs get that, right? And that's why eventually MMOs hit this point of where you have to just do another. Uh, you can do Final Fantasy XI online, which still does go on, but it was starting to see such dwindling numbers that it was like, well, we've got to do something, so we're going to make Final Fantasy XIV online. And now that one's doing really well, and I think there's going to reach a point where World of Warcraft just has to go, ah, we're done. We're going to make a new World of Warcraft because <laughs> you get debt from <laughs> the way that these games have been set up. Yeah, you do, but didn't Warcraft have a whole thing where they did do upgrades on themselves to the point where they were they sold a bespoke old version of the game? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they so. do slowly but surely. And they did something that most MMOs don't do with Cataclysm where they actually destroyed the entire world and yeah. went back through and redid all the art. Because normally what happens in these games is that you keep expanding them out and you don't go back to the early areas and redo the art. And I don't know if they've done it since, but I think the idea with Cataclysm was, well, this is a big expansion. This game is like eight years old, 10 years old at this point. We're going to take this as an opportunity to make the story, give us a reason to revisit all these places and redo the art so that they look newer and more modern and we can update how they work and, oh, look, improved grass distance, uh, grass rendering and stuff here. It's not that it's impossible. It's just a big development hurdle because it, you have to put a lot of work onto redoing stuff you've already done. Um And at some point, it's like, is it better to just do what Destiny 2 did? And most of the planets, pretty much nothing from Destiny 1 was in Destiny 2. Not at first, no. Yeah, and and they've eventually come back and done that. But because of that, it was like, well, we don't want to retread on ground we've already done. And we're doing this version here. It's going to be next gen only. So I get it. It is what it is. Uh, For the exciting thing... (laughs) <laughs> from at least one of us. I know Chris doesn't care. Uh, from two yeah. of us, I should say, because it's all us. From Software gave us a closer glimpse into the world of Elden Ring with 15 minutes of gameplay showcasing a number of locales, character builds, and mechanics seen within the game, as well as your normal From Software style things uh, like uh, people trying to potentially uh, send you in the wrong direction. It was a very interesting thing. Uh, I'll say my surprise was that when they announced 15 minutes and with it being an open world game, I expected uh, 15 minutes of of cut, like cut free gameplay. Like you just see somebody play for 15 minutes and instead they chose to not do that and do a bunch of like a minute here, 30 seconds here, a minute and a half here. Uh, but with that, they were able to show off a lot more about the game. Uh, so it looks great to me. There's a lot of really cool things. It kind of gives me... I know someone's going to say Breath of the Wild because clearly they've even said the game is Breath of the Wild inspired, but it actually kind of made me think of running around in the very large areas of dis- of uh, um, Darksiders 2 as death. Definitely whenever you like summon your horse and it ghostly comes out underneath you and you jump and then you it like air jumps and lands. It reminded me a lot of watching death and playing that on uh, Darks- Darksiders 2. But Saul, what's your thoughts here, man? I think it looks superb. So I have, I have a question for you because this is... 
something that I think from software is always going to have to deal with to a degree. And it doesn't mean that it's inherently a bad thing, mm-hmm. but I felt like this entire time talking about it and kind of showing the R and the way it's being like uh, somewhat advertised. I was like kind of hoping that this would be a notably different looking game. Definitely after Sekiro was actually a fairly different looking game. I mean, it no. still has the hallmarks. It does. But because but it had a, just the style. a specifically Japanese style, it ended up looking more different. Kind of like how Bloodborne was the first time that the FromSoft games really looked notably different from yeah. Demon Souls to Dark Souls 3. I, I think, though, that like with Bloodborne, starting with Bloodborne up until now, there's a very distinguished look upon them. It's a very grim, dark look. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, it doesn't look bad, but the one thing about this game is that it clearly looked like every other FromSoft game. I'm glad it does. Amalgamized <laughs> together. And I'm, again, it's not that it's bad. Yeah. It just surprised me. Because I, I, I guess I thought with all the changes they're making here, going open world, right? And also a big change uh, that, that came in that the gameplay kind of showed me I, that I hadn't thought of, even though it kind of makes sense. Uh, with an open world comes w- the idea of bosses that exist in the open world area. And I'm sure there will be bosses that still have the traditional fog wall that are in more like boss arenas. But that boss they showed of the guy on the horseback running around, I was like, that's a boss with no fog wall. So, what happens if you like, w- it's really interesting. Normally when you die, it's like you have that fog wall barrier, but that's interesting. Dark Souls 3 actually did that. Um, and it's DLC, and I oh, forgot okay. about this up the until Ashen. just last night. Well, it's the Ring City, Ring City, um, That's what it is, yeah. and then Ashes of Ariandril, and it's in Ring City. And everybody knows that in the main game of that that's played it, there's a boss called Dragon Slayer Armor. It's Ornstein's armor from Dark Souls One. It's on a bridge. It's a really cool boss fight. There's Iron. It's hard. <laughs> it is. There's Iron Dragon Slayer Armor just out in the out and about, just a single one of them in the Ring City. Um, that he has no fog wall. He is a boss, like a mini boss, um, and he gives you an entire armor set when you kill him. So if you die to him, you just have to run back to him. Well, I guess it's kind of like, but see, and that, he gives you tons to of me, souls. I think the difference there is to me, this feels like Demon Souls, where you fight the uh, the demon, whatever you want to call, it. I can't remember what it's called right now, um, the demon in the tutorial section, where it is a boss. It has a, a health bar. Yeah. That's on the bottom of the screen and everything. And it's treated like that. It's a one on one. There's no other enemies around. Yeah. But then when you go into what is it, three, one, two, one, whatever area that it is, you see the same demon and my brain, walking around. Yeah, he's just walking around. And yeah, he was a boss, but now he's got a normal health bar. When you kill him, he doesn't drop a well, he does actually drop a, a gray soul. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of what it feels like to me is like, well, we've done this boss elsewhere and now we're just including it elsewhere or something different, which is, I guess you're right. It is similar to that, but who's this feels say, like yeah. a specific boss. But who's you, to say you, there's not a bigger boss somewhere that's a, that's a copy right. of that one. You're right. Um, but they, but they, I guess all my expectation there is coming off the fact that the narrator in the video called that a boss. And I started looking and I said, I don't know why I wouldn't have thought about the fact that there would be open world bosses potentially. Well, to be fair, I was like, what do we, like at that point we get into defining what a boss is and that's kind of loose. True. Um, True. But yeah, in terms of like the way the game looks, the fashion is like the thing that caught my eye. All the character models and like their armors look sick. Magic looks sick. Their uh, uh, their particle systems that's a big jump. It is their particle systems look a lot like Demon Souls. Their lighting systems. system does too. Yeah, it's really pretty. Um, like when they went into like the catacombs, like these dark areas with shadows and stuff. The, the way the shadows was done was really well done. Um, I'm super excited uh, about it and. I will definitely be taking a week off of work to play this game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm really interested to see the bigger world not cut a bunch. Yeah. Like, I want to be able to look over the the, the landscape and kind of can do a th- full 360 and see. Like they did in the trailer. Yeah. And be like, okay, yeah, this is... But, you know, it's, it's, it's always weird. Trailers have... All, it's harder to soak in everything, but it does look really good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad they're doing that. Um, so that's cool. Uh, next thing up, Hangar 13, the developer behind Mafia 3 and Mafia Definitive Edition, have been working on a project which was codenamed Volt, which has seen a number of issues since its conception back in 2017 and subsequently has been canceled <coughs> by publisher 2K after spending $53 million toward its development. <laughs> The game was apparently a superhero game that saw players combating each other in online play, which is a ballsy move man there's been so many of those types of games but currently take two has said that no employees will lose their job at this junction and that the in the interim they will be moved to work on other projects within take two 
Now, there's been a lot of conversation up above this. Some people were immediately thinking this was something that it wasn't. Some people were calling this Bully 2. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And saying that that's what was got canceled. And then more information kind of came out. Um, the big question here is this idea of what happens to Hangar 13 at this point. And I know a lot of people are looking off of the fact that they loved Mafia 3 and Mafia Definitive Edition. but And this is not me being... 100% because I don't know. But I get the feeling that both Mafia 3 and Mafia Definitive Edition did not sell as well as Take 2 would have expected. And Mafia 3 had a bunch of development issues in terms of once the game released, there was a lot of bugs and stuff they had to go back and try and fix, even though people love the game. Um, so it does kind of make me wonder, like, I think it was Josh in our Discord who was like, well, we, I'm sure that they want them to do more Mafia, but what if they don't? What if Take Two doesn't want them to do more Mafia? What if they don't want to do more Mafia? What if Mafia Definitive Edition was like them being like, this is the last time that we really want to touch this franchise, but we want to do it right? Because I've heard only great things about Mafia <coughs> Definitive Edition. Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing that through now. The thing is with them doing Mafia, if they wanted them to do more Mafia, they would have done more Mafia when Mafia 3 came out, right? Instead, they decided we're not going to do more Mafia and we're going to do a new IP. <sighs> well, they kind of did, though, right? They, they did more Mafia... Well, I mean, ma- I mean a sequel to Mafia 3. I don't mean a, a remake. Yeah, a remake. I mean, fair. But it, it does make you wonder. I don't know how big Hangar 13 is. Is there a situation in here where the team that did Mafia Definitive Edition was doing Mafia Definitive Edition as a means of proving themselves to Take 2? So Take 2 would be like, okay, you get to make a new Mafia, Mafia 4. Maybe. I don't know. And, and maybe. We don't know. And this might have been the other half of the studio doing Volt and it just never quite working out. Um, but man, this idea of being a superhero game where you combat other players, I just, I think the weird thing there is that it could have been great. You never know. But it's not a very fresh idea. See, I think it sounds I, awesome. <laughs> I'm not going to say it doesn't sound awesome. But what I'm saying that you're looking at $53 million into a game that is n- apparently nowhere for the better, and it's an idea that's not entirely fresh, at some point it's going to be like, even if it ends up being a great game, or even if it sounds cool, because I, I agree with you, I think it sounds cool, but not to be worked on for six years, $53 million, well, and get nowhere. <sighs> it's, it's to the point where it's like, I feel like to some degree, big, and, and some of this comes from the expectation of who the publisher is, right? The reason that you can spend seven years working on Red Dead 2 is because you know at the end of the day, Red Dead 2 is going to sell gangbusters because it's an established IP, and they did a lot of really interesting new things in that game, even if there's plenty of things I wish they'd have focused more on, you know? Uh-huh. Excuse me. Um, I guess my thing to this is you say it's a tired idea, and I can't think of a single game that is like that. I don't mean a tired idea, but I guess there's been games that approach this enough ways, like DC Universe Online, City of well, Heroes. There's been MMOs for years and years. Now, of course, all of those are outside of the idea of where we are now, where this is being looked at as very likely a game as a service title rather than an, an MMO. MMO or yeah, because that's what City of Heroes was an MMO, DC UO was an was an MMO, and there are absolutely other games where you have powers and you walk around and you and you do stuff and, and fight each other, but I mean, some of them have been really bad, really bad. Um, but I don't. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's at a point because there was a thing in the in the article, which I think was by Jason Schreier over on uh, Bloomberg, where he was talking about the pe- the people that came forth and spoke anonymously about the game said that Take Two was never quite sold on the idea, but they were letting them do it anyway. And I think that when you kind of couple the idea that Take Two was never just excited about it but then gave you six years and $53 million to try it out. It's not surprising at some point they had to be like, we got to pull the plug. You're not getting yeah. anywhere. We can't keep pushing this idea because as a, such a big developer putting so much money or publisher rather putting so much money in, they do kind of have a duty to make sure that they're not just going to waste their money on something that by the time it comes out is likely not going to be, Think about there's plenty of big games that I'm like that looks really cool and it comes out and it's a flash in the pan that's it. I don't think that you want a 53 million dollar investment that you'd have to pay more to get it where you needed it to come out be a flash in the pan and go away. You know, I mean, you look at like what was it? I think Grand Theft Auto Five, which is Take Two. I mean, it's Rockstar, but Take Two owns them. Is at 155 million units this as of this year, and Red Dead's at 39 million. And those are the numbers that you're kind of looking against. And I'd be really interested to see what Mafia 3 sales even were, you know? 
to kind of get an idea. It looks like the game has sold 7 million copies. So they were giving, I feel like this is an interesting time where it looks like Take Two was actually giving them a lot of slack and a lot of budget to try something off the back of a game that only sold 7 million copies when this is the same publisher that is selling The Outer Worlds, a game that cost significantly less and sold significantly more. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess the problem is that... Uh, or the profit margin was more. I mean, tech, <clears throat> I don't think The Outer Worlds sold 7 million copies, but it was no. just an example. I think the thing with uh, Mafia 3 is that I guess they needed to sell 8 million units to be profitable. Yeah, and, and they just missed the mark. Which is exactly. interesting. Like, I'm curious, like Mafia Definitive Edition sales, like what was the sales numbers for that? If they've even come out with them, they may not have. Uh, it looks like people who are kind of guesstimating because there's not an official report. It sold 2 million copies of the Mafia trilogy, which contained the Definitive Edition. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, remakes are a lot cheaper to make by nature of how they work. You have a line already. You, you have you don't have to do all this work to figure out what the game's going to be because you have it and you're just building up a better version of it. Um, but, yeah, interesting. So 2 million copies of that was probably a bigger success than 7 million of Mafia 3. Ironically, yeah, you know? So it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know, but the bigger thing here is whether or not the studio does eventually get canned, even though they're saying right now that they're not going to. Um, I just don't feel like there's that much love for this studio to the degree where I don't think Hangar 13 is even a remotely household name for the majority of even the in the no gaming community, you know? Yeah, I would agree with that. So we'll see if they get to stick around or if they just end up getting absorbed into another studio to basically be support people like most of Activision has, <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. Take Two's got bigger games to worry about, you know. If, if all of Hangar Thirteen goes towards supporting Rockstar North or whoever's working on uh, Grand Theft Auto Six, it wouldn't surprise me. And it might be a better money move while not having to deal with the PR or anything of closing a studio and shuttering a studio. Um, definitely, when you're making billions of dollars on <laughs> Grand Theft Auto Five shark cards every year, <laughs> I guess you can yeah. afford that fifty-three million dollar development. To be eaten up. We'll make it up in one week of GTA Online. Probably, yeah. (laughs) Last thing on the news, PS Now's November lineup has been revealed and includes Mafia Definitive Edition, interestingly enough. The remake of the first Mafia, like we said. Totally reliable delivery service, which looks like a solo or co-op delivery game where platforming meets ragdoll physics. and actually kind of looks goofy, but... Can't you know, this would be the t- perfect type of game for this service, is what I is what I'm saying. Yep. And then uh, Final Fantasy IX and Celeste, both great games. Um, so there you are. That is where we are for now. And we are, I guess, going to move into uh, the community's take here. And the community's take that I ended up coming up with since last week's is the one thing we ended up talking about was fun, but we were in a rush because of Halloween. Hope you all had a great Halloween. And if you weren't in an area that celebrates Halloween, that you just had a good. Good Sunday, you know what I mean? Enjoy uh, Good week, but... <laughs> yeah, you can go buy... Hey, Halloween is up to you. If you want to go buy a bunch of candy, put up some spooky stuff, and then say it's Halloween, you control whether or not Halloween celebrated in your household. It's a state of mind. Unless you live in a country that, like, forbids that. Like, if we find out that you're secretly <laughs> celebrating Halloween in your house, we're going to just... How do you secretly celebrate Halloween? I mean, isn't that basically what the Salem Witch Trials were? <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. yours <laughs> it was just white women celebrating ha- Halloween in private <laughs> and people being like hold up we don't like the way this looks oh my god also yeah sure Saul that'll be mine for the day I'll take it um, but yeah there you go hope you had a good Halloween <laughs> and if not consider you know if, if nothing else maybe our new because I got a new computer and then realized I was using an old version of our movie editor there's a bunch of Halloween edits in our in our episode where there's like bat transitions flying through and it's, it's great dude I loved it <laughs> and weird. I had a little cackle laugh at the end of the uh, at the end of the intro as well so good times Hall- Halloween's Solid. fun you know what I mean <clears throat> So, the community's take was, do you prefer silent protagonists in games? And I used examples, Dead Space, Grand Theft Auto 3, and then I used Skyrim as an example, but there's actually a conversation to be had there. Uh, Or a voice protagonist, as in Deathloop, Kingdom Hearts, Fallout 4, and why. And part of the reason I kind of used Skyrim and Fallout 4 is because of the fact that they are very different from each other in the way that Bethesda approached uh, how your character interacts with the world. But... 
uh, I kind of I was telling Chris where this came from is I was playing Guardians, and this thing kind of crossed my mind where it, it's weird. I said Guardians is great, right? And I do think the gameplay is solid, but it's kind of like what we talked about with, uh, in my opinion, it's kind of like what we talked about with uh, Spec, Spec Ops. Ops. I think the gameplay is just fine. Fine. It's fun enough. It moves you through the moments. I think the most interesting aspect of the gameplay <clears throat> actually comes from the fact that you can send commands to the the other teammates. But the story is what I think is really great in this game. And I thought about, like, what if this was a game where they decided to have it be where you are Star-Lord, but you're unvoiced and you never you never actually say anything. And instead, you just choose. And I guess this is like Chris's argument for Skyrim, right? You have dialogue decisions, but if you just chose them, but no words were ever said, I feel like suddenly Star-Lord loses a lot of personality. Even just by not being voiced, even if you want to say that technically he's not silent within the world, he's saying things that you are telling him to say. But if he doesn't vocally send them out, I feel like the team dynamic and all of the way the characters work together takes a huge impact. Um, And Mm -hmm. of course, we're used to the ideas most of the time in, in gaming these days that you have a voice protagonist. It's very odd for a game to come out without one. Normally, if it, if it doesn't have one, it's because of a very specific design choice that still is kind of going to be surprising for most people, or it's going to be that it was a more budgeted game. I mean, like something like Dark Souls where you don't have any kind of voice, but your character gets talked to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so to that degree, and I'll, I'll be, I kind of want to ask you guys that in the long run as well, but we're going to look at some of the uh, answers. The first one, which brings up a conversation here is from Blake Popes over on Facebook. And he says, is Skyrim really a silent protagonist though? No, like, sure. There's no voice acting, but in the world, he technically speaks, you pick an option and they respond. So unless he's writing down what he says, then he's not silent. Uh, arguably he is writing down what he's saying. If you're just choosing a text block and then he's. I would actually love a game for you to be that you select a text dialogue and you kind of see your character scribbling <laughs> and then like, turn around a piece of paper. I would, uh, but that, that does bring uh, in the thing. It, this is a different layer of silent protagonist. It's, yeah, it's I a see. non-voice protagonist that has something to say within the world they exist. It's you. You are the voice yeah, protagonist. That, that's objectively not a silent protagonist. That's a quiet, I'm not like a non-voice I'm just, protagonist. I know, but I'm just saying like. Skyrim absolutely doesn't have a silent protagonist, in my opinion. GTA 3 has a silent protagonist. There's no way Which Skyrim is crazy, does. right? Does Claude, Be- not, does Claude not talk Claude in GTA does not talk one at time. all. Claude, and it's so weird because I remember like immediately going into Vice City, the biggest thing to me, I was like, whoa, was Tommy he's a voice? voiced? Yeah. 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 And then, That's of course, the CJ has a voice. <laughs> Everybody knew that CJ was voiced because that's a quotable game if there ever was one. Yeah. Um, so it really is to, to that go, degree. Yeah. It, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> that, that's that's my me. one for the episode. <laughs> yeah, that's my one for the episode. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's still something to be said that f- a lot of the things that a voiced protagonist uh, or whatever you want to call it brings to a game is vocal. Like, okay. A good example between the two, right? Very RPG heavy between the two of them. A game that has all of the same type of decisions and still has all these RPG mechanics and everything is like um, um, Greedfall. Greedfall sure. and Skyrim are similar in that you make responses and you do these things and then the character goes about them. But I think that you have more of an idea of who Desarde is. But that's yeah. also, I guess, because of the way the story is told, right? I guess the difference between them is that Desarde has more of what feels like a personality in the way that he responds, even if you're choosing what he says. So you're choosing minute parts of his personality, but then the way that this voice actor chooses to embody the character and say these lines adds to part of who this character is. And it feels like even though you're making decisions about what's being said and being done, you're still really looking in on someone else. Whereas I think Skyrim is this idea that you create a character completely, and you do create a character in Greedfall with Desarde, but you are a specific person. You're the son of the legate <laughs> congregation. Anyway, um, the the difference there is I think Skyrim and Morrowind and Oblivion, you're just a person. Yes. You're always the chosen one for some stupid reason, but you're you're just a person. And even though you make your character and you go through all that trouble, you don't there's really nothing about even in Skyrim, you could say, Well, you're the dragonborn, but 
that doesn't really play in anything. You don't have other characters that you talk about that were previously Dragonborn. The closest you get is like the Greybeards. So I think the story setups go into that a lot, right? So I'll give you, I'll concede that you're not a silent protagon- protagonist, but you're also not a voice protagonist. So there we are. Yeah, but I, I don't know. We're gonna have to Die on the hill, Chris. Anymore. What do you want to say? Die I, on the I hill. just, I don't, I think given the two other games you used to compare, it, Skyrim doesn't fit at all. That's just it. Like Dead Space, well, yeah, Isaac I'm, is not, spoken and does not speak. GTA 3, Claude does not speak. Skyrim, your character talks all the time. The entire game is your character talking. It's just not voiced. So here, here's a bigger question, and this is a something I'm curious about because I really, when someone's mute, mm-hmm. right? Can they sign language? Yeah, can they or do they? No, do they? If they sign language, are they no longer considered mute? Th- that's a real question because I guess well, we no. could consider no, that a silent you can't protagonist speak. is essentially mute. Yeah, mute means you physically or you physically mentally can't cannot speak. speak. Okay, then yeah. the Skyrim protagonist is a mute protagonist. No, he's not. But what, no, I can't. Hey, okay, when you choose a when you choose a dialogue <laughs> option, he Hold speaks. On. He speaks out loud. He says these he things speaks to, to these characters. People. He Do you, you hear it? You hear it? Yeah, you hear it. Can I take you this? You hear him say you this? Pick, can I take this conversation pick. in a harder turn? Hold on. Fine. Let's compare a direct game from Hold the same on. person. On. Fallout I've... Four. When you choose the dialogue option, your character says it in the world. Right. You hear it. They hear it. And that was a, yes. That's Hold the on. difference. Your character. Go ahead, Saul. Okay. I will fight to the ends of earth on this. Okay, so he's mute. You're right? wrong. He's mute. He, he, he is Silent Bob. He's, he's Silent Bob. Yes. Doesn't that disqualify itself when he uses dragon shouts? Doesn't he say something then? Just he not, does. Not in English language. There you does. go. Voice he protagonist. Does. Immediately you <laughs> lost. You're already wrong. Thank you, Saul. I don't even have to defend <laughs> my point. He dragon shouts. You're wrong. Foos da, mother flarker. Look at that. I even censored myself. There's no wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless so, of the fact, Chris, I am curious of your thing there, though, because before that, I think that that's an interesting point. I think that's more of just mechanics and doing their thing. But in the way that the game presents uh-huh. your character uh-huh. between Skyrim and Fallout Four, mechanics. When you choose a dialogue option in Fallout yeah. Four, your character says something. And I hate the way it does it because you see like two words and then he says four sentences that yeah, don't right. even line up with what you thought he was going to say. There's a mod for that that works really well. That's good because God, that's annoying. Uh, <laughs> but you have that, and you choose an option, and he physically says it in the world yeah. he's in. In Skyrim, you choose an option. He says zero words, but the it's it's understood that the other he characters is not a silent protagonist. He is, he is not a voiced protagonist because the characters respond to silent what you means say. It's audible. No, silent it hates. Silent Salt. just means that there's no sound. Hold on, look, hold on. Silent definition. Let me look it up real quick. Let me look up the definition of when silent. You put, not when you making put, or accompanied by any sound, Chris. When you when you put when you Skyrim that, just, next to Dead Space and GTA three, you're wrong. If you had used uh, if you had put out of, Fallout out of three, the Skyrim, Fallout two, sure, you would have been right. You put Dead Space, GTA three, wrong. You are wrong. Those They're, are hey, wrong examples. They're I got you wrong. right. Are you ready? They're, they're still different, but you know what they share in common? None of them freaking talk. Can somebody pick me up from school? My parents are <laughs> here. None of them talk. Guess what? They're silent. When you choose the words, they're not making or accompanied by any sound. You just got Webster, boy. But Hush. Skyrim, the character talks. The that? Dragonborn speaks. The entire game is the Dragonborn speaking. He is a when? literal political figure. When you click when? on the entire freaking text thing that he says, that is Yeah, because you know what he does? You know what he does? He goes... Behind the camera, he's first person. You don't see it. I like to announce that episode two thirty six is my last episode. <laughs> 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 place hold on, hold on. All you gotta do, all you gotta do, is play Skyrim VR and look down. But then you yeah, move your hands, though, wrong. depending on what you're doing. But more importantly, look, he is silent. He is not accompanied by sound. I will die on that hill, Chris. Okay, you are correct you in the fact that the context silent? between them is the the context between the difference of him and Claude and 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 Isaac. I'll give you that. But the the thing that precedes that, which is silent protagonist, he is still very much silent. My my point is that Skyrim doesn't belong in this question because <laughs> they're Chris, at, Chris, in the way they are. Let me, let, let me ask you something real quick. Yes. Look look at Discord. Okay. Yes, I can hear you because you're on mic. Did you hear me say that? Say what? 
Did I audibly say that sentence that I just typed and sent to you on Discord? What sentence? I, I won't say it anything. because then you're going to say <laughs> that you heard bastard. me say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the anyway. point I am making. The point I'm making is that in context in the game, the character speaks. The point that I'm Claude making is that I just spoke. And I, Isaac, in, hold on. Do I not. just spoke to you. Hey, I, I just said I communicated with you. That's Are different. you trying to argue that the Dragonborn texts to Jarl Bargro? He could text, are he could you, sign language, are, he could that, write on a marker. Is he that your argument? He could use magic to telepathically send this. Bro, yes, you absolutely. Did, bro, you didn't do the... Hold on, Chris, are you telling me you didn't do the Daedric tw- uh, quest to get the Daedric Motorola Razor? Like, bro, yeah. Uh, speaking of Claude, though, Jeff Schrock on Facebook says, <laughs> Voiced protagonist for sure. I just like to play as a character with personality. Part of why GTA 3 has aged so poorly, in my opinion, is that Claude is just lifeless. lifeless. It's true. I just find myself Completely not disagree. character. Completely Claude wrong. is the least compelling character that Grand Theft Auto has ever had. That's fair, but Claude absolutely has personality, and they show it a ton in that game. Okay, I'll tell you this much. Replaying it until we get these new versions is really hard, though, because playing those games on older TVs, it probably looks better. He's got a lot of facial expression. I'll give you that. He and he has multiple times where like, there's that guy who betrays you that they take and the guy's like, please save me. And he just looks at him and walks away. That is entirely yeah. personality. Body so language think, as well. But he yeah. is still lifeless in comparison to the others. So yeah, oh. I mean, contextually speaking, I understand that. Would you say he's ableist, silent? But whatever. Yeah, absolutely silent. Yeah. Yes. Claude is a silent protagonist. Unaccompanied by the sound. Dragonborn yeah. is not. Yeah. The Dragonborn is not. <laughs> pl- yep. Objectively wrong, like literally <laughs> objectively wrong. No, literally, literally, and dictionarily speaking. No. Dictionarily, uh, Google, I, well, Webster me that wrong. You just got Webster, boy. Just you're gonna have to take that. Look, you got you took that W, but not the win. The Webster, you, you got you got Webstered. Do what you will you're with objectively that. Uh, dictionarily wrong. is an actual word. Of course, it is. Because in it, terms of or by means of a dictionary or of dictionaries course. collectively. Yeah, see, look, you got you got Webster too, boy. Ain't it? <laughs> I'm Webster and everyone today. Yo no hablo okay. inglés. Uh, what's that? I say, Yo no hablo inglés. No, please, you have to type it to me so I can hear it. It's the only way that this works. He's not silent though. Yo no hablo <laughs> hablo inglés. You probably spelled all that wrong. It is spelled wrong. No, it's, it's not. Like this. <laughs> oh boy we're having fun What's today next? all right let's see <laughs> uh we've got liam and i think liam's is interesting he says silent protagonists don't bother me since i'm ancient as f and grew up with protagonists who don't even give a courtesy response um yeah and that is exactly what happens uh to the majority of of skyrim whenever a conversation just ends someone says something to you and you genuinely can't even respond um on certain you hadn't had <laughs> hundreds of dialogue options before that to speak to the mm. other people in the game. Mm, no, to, to, to communicate. I will continue not, to argue this. You're not so speaking. We just you're stop. communicating. You're I communicating. will fight this for five hours. Our next live stream is me and you getting a jury together. I'm a down. Panel. <laughs> and we must make our arguments and we have time to strengthen them. And we I must take strength. Them. I'm right. The Lord mm-hmm. is with me. <laughs> Chris, you know what? There's a podcast that asked Saul and I to be on for something that we vehemently disagree on, and we this we didn't end. quite know what to do that would be fun. This is it. This is me and you. Me and you can go on this podcast, and there will be uh, there will be a judge who determines who wins. So I'm very uh, down. I should reach out to them and see if they're still doing it, <laughs> if it's still going, and we could uh, that could be our our fun time. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I like Liam's response because older games, clearly you used to not having a voice protagonist. But then again, or uh, uh, even a word, right, to go towards his thing. Even in older games where you just don't communicate at all because they didn't even bother putting in anything, it's just like, okay, you're not going to say anything back, but people are going to communicate through text with you because voice acting was not possible in any real way back on these old consoles. True. Um, do you ever like hear the first games that had like technically voice acting in them and how crazy crushed it was like the voice acting is it was and arcade it was, games yeah and it wasn't even like even like house like, of the dead even console games right didn't have much but you'd be like playing nba jam or something and on the old old consoles and you'd be like you'd hear them like randomly say like Tar-bar! it was like i couldn't even understand that it just sounded like compressed mess gaming has come a long way let's see what <laughs> What are you doing? This is House, House of, the of the Dead, Dead 2. 
God, that's terrible. Ooh. Everybody needs to go look up House of the Dead 2 voice acting. It's the worst. Uh, Rude Days 93, one of our patrons Listen. says, in games. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds awful in my ear. In games where you create your own character, I prefer the silent protagonist. I envision myself as the character, and many times the voice customization isn't very good. Games like Kingdom Hearts, I prefer to be voiced since it's that character's story, not your story like a Skyrim. Um, I was going to steal that one, just to throw Skyrim back in there. I, I figured. That's why I actually chose it. <laughs> <clears throat> but it would have been more funny if you chose I'm totally it. On, on, on. You know what? I'm on Chris's side. I don't care. I That's fine. Know. I don't care. We I'm both got webs right. today, so it doesn't change anything. The protagonist you are speaks. You are, you are objectively talks. wrong. No, no. Now, if you want to say that in your opinion, which is not objective, by the way, it's subjectively. I'm use objectively your words. Right. Got Webster again, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I'm sorry. I'm kidding. <laughs> On that level, but yeah, you subjectively. You subjectively can say that that you view him as speaking when you hit that response, but he does not speak and you do not hear it. You can turn your TV up to 100, buddy, and all you're going to hear is nothing because there's nothing being said. Unaccompanied by sound. You just got lawyered, Webster, all those things. The protagonist um, still speaks. The entire game is speaking. He talks the whole game. Mm-hmm. You 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 give me a clip of audio from the Dragonborn speaking, and then I'll I'll seed your argument. Okay, I'll okay? find one right now. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Uh, Danny Candyman Villiobos, another one of our patrons, says, I prefer voice protagonist. I'm always invested with a game story. So when a main character doesn't talk like a Neo 2 or someone else talks for them, like your ghost in Destiny, it always bums me out. However, if a game story has the main character be silent on purpose and is executed well, I'm fine with that. And there are examples. Like the first Dishonored, Corvo doesn't say pretty much anything that I'm aware of. I think Dishonored 2 is where they introduce voice acting and they brought back the voice actor from Garrett from the original Thieves to be uh, the original Thief games to be uh, Corvo. So <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I was looking it up and I hit mute by accident. There you go. Found one. <laughs> All right, cool. I'll, I'll look at it in a second. Um, oh my God. Uh, okay. There you go. So Fusro Da. He speak. Okay. He spoke. Dragon Tom. He lost. Immediately, it's over. Thank you, Saul. Continue. I said a dialogue line. There's no dialogue choice there. When you the dialogue you click, is Fusro da. Fusro da. I clicked on Fusro Da. <laughs> no, you clicked on a button to do that shout. That's all you did. I had to choose it wasn't my a dialogue. You know how many shouts are in that game? Shout, Chris. Shout. Let it all. Let out. it all out, my man. <laughs> <laughs> right, look, we found our common ground. I love you, buddy. <laughs> We're back. It's my birthday on Wednesday. I win the argument for my birthday. <laughs> That's my gift is I win. We'll see. Come Wednesday, I'll, I'll determine whether or not I want to allow you that. <laughs> we'll see. You don't get early birthday presents. Not from me. I don't believe in that. Oh, wow. I say as I give my wife a phone for Christmas and her birthday two weeks prior to <laughs> either of them. <laughs> uh, let's see. I want to do... See, I think that's all of them, isn't it? We'll do one more because I think this one's interesting. Josh says, uh, both can be good. Also, Isaac from Dead Space absolutely talks. And I had to go in and clarify. I did mean Dead Space 1. And this is something interesting. I'm so glad that in the Dead Space remake, they're voicing Isaac because there is zero reason for Isaac not to talk. And arguably, I think it's so weird to try and sell me on this idea of Isaac's wife being like involved here and he has nothing to say. He has zero to say. But then in the next game, suddenly Isaac won't shut the fuck up. And I don't mean that in a bad way because I like Isaac, but it's so weird to go for a game where no one's like he doesn't speak a word to anyone. He w- he witnesses someone die and he doesn't even gasp. He wa- he sees this horrible thing he's never seen in his life before and he can't even muster up a what the F or oh, or anything. He's just <laughs> running in his heavy space armor. I think I kind of like it because it almost makes you feel like uh, like feel the trauma this man's going through. So this man's so traumafied. Traumafied. <laughs> Look, I just I unwebbed you myself. I'm through. sorry. That's not a word. <laughs> but he's so tra- traumatized uh, that before he even knows exactly what happened to his wife, he can't speak to anyone speaking to him on the Ishimura. I'm not saying it makes sense. I'm just saying in the game, I understand it as like, oh, he's so flarked up that he's he can't talk. <laughs> well, I will say that um, 
in in the first game, I didn't mind him not being voiced. Like, but by the second game, when they chose to completely scrap that, I was like, okay, then why didn't you just do it in the first game right. too? Well, I mean, that's when it gets. But weird. I will say, the first game does feel like specific choice of we want to add to the mood by making it where your character doesn't talk so that the silence of the game is part of what makes it scary you don't have this random babble of your character walking around being like oh because like death loop i love that game but colt talks a ton so if that game was trying to be scary it would completely fail because you would be constantly talking but yeah. and when you're trying to be scary and you don't say anything it's kind of adds to that tension of like nothing's being said this is t- kind of weird and creepy there's no noise going but oh well um all right thank you guys for the answers and the spirited debate that came from them blake i hope you know that you're involved in this uh <laughs> you're you're <laughs> you're part of this whether Death you want to be or blake not post. yeah the ghost of blake post continues to talk on discord <laughs> thank you all right let's see do you guys have a main topic that you'll kind of want to talk about from the things we've already talked about do you think we've already kind of covered that or do you have just a funny, a fun idea for a yeah, quick I, main topic? To throw in? I brought one up like last week. Oh, what, what was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did, you did, mm-hmm. uh, and I said that I wanted you to spearhead it. So go ahead, Chris, I spearhead, your, spearhead your your thing. So I had been thinking about this, where I think that there is an argument that gamers have a responsibility to go buy Guardians of the Galaxy. And it's not about Guardians of the Galaxy. What it's about is the type of game it is and the tenor of the conversation in the games indu- in the game industry that I think if you're not buying Guardians of the Galaxy, you're not doing what you want, right? Because I think the tenor of the industry right now is everything is live service, everything is Battle Royale, everything is free-to-play, everything is microtransaction. And if you're going to whine about that, and then you're not going to go buy Guardians and tell Square Enix and tell other publishers off the success of Guardians that you want these things, then I don't think you can complain anymore. It, does that make sense? Yeah, so it's, yeah, so it's, it's less about... Guardians is just the, the, the gateway we're example. using. Yeah, yeah it's, it's your launching pad for the thing. But you're really saying, do gamers, at least gamers that specifically talk about um, that they're not, they're, they're distaste for the way that gaming seems to be going. And then Square Enix has remarked that it's interesting, right? Because you're talking about a Square Enix published game, and yet. Mm-hmm. Square Enix is the one saying that they think games as a service is going to be a large part of the future. Well, as somebody who doesn't really care for that and doesn't really want that, I actually do feel a, a, a somewhat of a weight on me to be a little more open to game that I'm unsure about. And I'll tell you right now, I was unsure about Guardians. Mm-hmm. I was very unsure about Guardians. Me too. Um, because mostly of how I felt about Avengers from Avengers being shown. And now having not played Avengers, I felt like I was vindicated when everyone else is kind of like, yeah, Avengers has okay qualities here and there, but it mostly misses the mark. And it felt like, okay, I was kind of right all along that this was not the right mix up. And Square says it right now. Crystal Dynamics was not the right studio for this. I thought that was weird too. Crystal Dynamics is making a games as a service Avengers game. It's a weird yeah, sentence to be sense. said. So, But it is one of those things to where I'm a big proponent of trying games. Like a big reason I bought play, uh, Plague Tale uh, Innocence was because I thought it looked mildly interesting, but it was a double A game, and I just I didn't know. But I was like, it seems like it's going to be story heavy, and boy was I right, and I'm not glad I bought it. I felt mm-hmm. a need to buy Greedfall because I was like, this feels like what I want to see in a game where, and, and it's for a different reason, right? But it's it's the same basic idea of what I want to see gaming come back to in a bigger way. Greedfall. I didn't know for sure, but I was like, it seems like this might be a classic RPG. So I'm going to try it out. And boy, is it. You get to do all these classic RPG things that I wish more modern RPGs would lean into. Like, I would personally really like Elder Scrolls 6 to go pretty far back into a more closed off and sectioned out RPG than this big open one that Skyrim became. It's unlikely to happen, and that's okay. There could be multiple types. But that's why I felt the like, buying those games. I felt the need to be open about them, experience them, and then I'm I come out on the other side with those being two of my favorite games of last generation. Weirdly right. enough, so I think that you're right. There's an argument <laughs> to be made. I don't. I think every gamer just has to differ a little bit. That's kind of where I'm standing here. I don't think that you can wholesale look at someone and be like, "You need to go buy this game." But if no. I think that there is an argument to be, uh, I really would even say more than that. There is a straight up duty for the people who want to talk mess about the state of games as a service to right. go out and openly buy games like this 
so they can continue to show developers and publishers that they want them, right. which clearly is happening. Otherwise, Sony would not still be making so many single player only games. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I think I think with Sony, it's one of those things where that's Sony's reputation. So I don't know. I guess people know that's going to happen. When you look at Square Enix and they're like clearly trying to decide: do we go Avengers or do we go single player route? I think I think it's one of those things where like if you're going to be an active person and talking about this stuff and then whining about the stuff that you don't like, and then something comes out that is what you want a single player linear game and then you're like well I don't like the guardian so I'm not going to buy this I think like okay fine that's fair and reasonable but then you don't get to complain the next time square enix is like hey avengers is an mmo you know I think I think that that's not a bad thought process to have I do think that it's hard to generalize things in that matter so for an example I have said multiple times that I miss Games with nothing attached to them, no DLC, or DLC is fine, but like no season pass, no multiplayer, um, kind of a one and done thing. And if they want to add on DLC, I think that's fine as long as it's not something dumb like a month after release. Um, but because I may be an advocate for that kind of game, doesn't mean that I should be looked at negatively if I don't want to buy Guardians of the Galaxy. Because my my opinion of Guardians, I may not be a comic book fan. I may think it looks dumb. It could be a it could be a, a you know a plethora of things. Plethora. Ha! I've got Webster myself. Uh, but yeah, it could be <laughs> it could be so many different. Can we start reasons. something here, Webster. Maybe so. <laughs> um, but it could be so many different reasons on why I don't want it that it may not just it may you know make perfect sense that I shouldn't get it. I don't think yeah, that but- as a consumer you should feel an obligation for this kind of thing unless it's something you're passionate about. So there's nothing wrong with saying I feel like I should buy Guardians to support this team because it looks so good, which is my thought process. But I don't think that I can look at somebody and not and think they don't have that same process. That's a negative, you know, that's a negative connotation about them because it could no. be for a reason that's not seen. I'm not saying it's a negative connotation, but I think if you had an argument, I, honestly, uh, truly, if you had an argument with me and you were saying I hate all these games that have all this stuff and I want to return to stuff like this, and then I look at you and you say, "Okay, did you buy Guardians?" Because that's exactly what you want, and you say no, then I go, "Okay, then why are you talking to me about this? You're not doing well, anything to affect change." Guardians may not have been their jam, but then something like Greedfall could have been. Yeah, and I think that that's why I think that Guardians being the launching point makes a lot of sense because it is right. It, it's very it's most of what you just said. So there's no DLC that exactly. we know of yet, and even if it comes, that's not a big deal because DLC is new content being worked separately. That's yeah, fine. and they as long as it's this has after. nothing coming ever. They know it's I one and done. So. This is it. Yeah, I think that there's absolutely zero DLC for costumes. All of them are in the game, and there's tons of them. They're awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's it, good. Yeah, there's there's no season passes. There's no forced multiplayer. There's no games as a service. Anything. If anything, this is one of the most gamey games I've played in a while. There's decision making. You're going into the decision making, and depending on what you do. It, and what I like is that it skews the idea that most games do. Where like even Greedfall, which I loved, does that thing that most do, where it's like, well, if you helped us, then we're going to come back in the end and help you. Uh, but it's just different the way it does it here, right? It's not that you had to... Those games are always if you just chose to do it. These are whether or not you failed or succeeded at doing the thing you tried to do because you're going to get to try to do it regardless. It's not about you going out and exploring. Mm -hmm. It's about you're going to be presented with an opportunity. (laughs) Do you fail or succeed at the outcome that you wanted and how does that impact the ending of the game? And that's pretty cool. Uh, And I don't feel like that's, you know, that's it's a very gamey game, but I think it's still something that's open up for people who aren't used to that to be able to play it. Yeah, and I do need to be clear, this is, really doesn't have anything to do with Guardians. I don't care if you buy Guardians or not. I just think that when games like this come around, given, again, given the tenor of the industry where people are all, oh, every Battle Royale sucks, or, you know, I don't want live service games, or I don't want multiplayer. And then you look at me and you have that argument and you say, okay, did you buy Guardians? Did you support this? And you say no. Then I look at you and I just say, okay, then we can't be having this conversation to me because that's just like you're not you're not buying the things that you say you want so why are you arguing that these things should be there you know you know what i mean so, it's kind of like how i said with um, good good well it's like how i said with near right where i refused to play near because i didn't like the trophies thing mm-hmm. i might be the only person in this world who did that and the but, only reason you played it is because i bought it for you you didn't yeah. 
you did not actively seek to buy the game. You no. stood your ground on that, which I, exactly. I, I applaud. I straight up told you, I was like, I won't do a <laughs> spoiler cast if, if I have to pay for it. I won't. And, yeah. <clears throat> you know, that was me at least sitting there and being like, okay, it, it's the opposite situation, right? I wasn't forced to not spend my money. Oh, no. You know what I but mean? But it was I also the spend. same situation because I bought a game twice yeah. that I wasn't even going to get to play with the second purchase just because <clears throat> I want to see more games like that and I wanted to have the conversation with you. And I was like, right. even if he hates it, I gave the game another sale. And now this game is at, what, 7 million copies sold yeah. on a game that they spent almost no money on? Yeah, that's awesome. And it's everything I want in a game. But to go back towards Saul's thing, and it's kind of why whenever I answered... I went broad scope. It's kind of why I think that it's less about, did you buy a one game? Right. I think to like, let's look at your, what if situation, if we're having this conversation and then you go, did you buy guardians? Cause it's everything you talked about. And you say, no, I don't think that wholesale shuts them down. If they're having that exact same conversation with you and then you go, well, what's the last game that you bought that you feel fit that need? And they go, um, and, and I, it's, I'm trying to think of one. It can be creep fall. Cause we know creep fall definitely yeah. fits that same, that same <laughs> thing. They go, oh, I bought edition. Yeah, yeah, we bought. I bought Mass Effect Legendary Edition. I bought Great Falls PS5 version. I bought, I bought the Shark game. I bought Man Eater. Those yeah, are all games that go into those things. I bought Yakuza Seven. I bought all these different things. I think you're still part of that conversation, and that's kind of why I think I went into the idea of. For me, it's less about I have to buy every game that that proposes itself to be part of that solution, and rather I look at it and go, I'm more open, and if a game even has a tinge of interest from me. I'm pretty willing to give it a try. Now, if I look at a game and I go, just man, it may be what I'm talking about, but let's use Guardians as an example. I'm not really a big fan of third person shooters. So, I, and, you know, I could give it a try, but I'm also not, I don't really love decision making in video games. I don't like the way that typically plays in. Uh, I'm not a big space proponent. I don't care for, I don't have any care for the Guardians of the Galaxy as characters. I'm going to skip that out, but I'm going to turn around and buy whatever the next big game is that does all the things we're talking about. Horizon Forbidden West. Yeah. Then you're not, I mean, you're still part of that conversation <laughs> with them, right? You can still have that thought process. But I think that there's a duty for people who have that conversation to be open to buying as many games that, that propose themselves to be that while still looking and filtering it through what their interests are. Yeah. I, my biggest thing Even is if like they worry have, that the game may not be good. <clears throat> right. That you have. You have to speak with your wallet. And to me, it was very important. Hey, I love the Guardians regardless. I'm a comic book guy. So I was going to buy Guardians anyway. But I think I said to you when the review started coming out, I was like, holy crap, that was the most risk, the most risk I've taken pre ordering a game, right? Because the Guardians could have been awful and it's not. It's awesome. Um, Yeah. I just. I don't know. It's hard for me because I just don't like necessarily some of the conversations we have in this in the in people talking about the industry and people are very flippant to just be like, oh, this stuff sucks or I hate the way this industry is going or the microtransactions are too bad. And then you get something like this and it sells soft and then it never comes back. Look at Metroid, right? People whined about there not being a 2D Metroid game for 20 years, supposedly. I don't mm-hmm care at all about metroid the last but, 2d metroid game that wasn't a remake i think was metroid fusion yeah Samus returns that was a 3ds game well it, it was a remake no yeah. people, say, people say that that's not a remake yeah it's a remake of metroid 2 no it's not it's a sequel to metroid 2 it is not a remake that's why it's called either way I, I didn't play it because i didn't have a 3ds at that point but the reason I'm that sure that's not a remake it is a remake of the 91 Game Boy game Metroid 2 Return of Samus. So they made it Re- Samus Returns and not Return of Samus, I guess. Yeah, they just chose to switch the name up for whatever reason. But yeah, it was if a remake you, of Metroid if 2. You so look, so to his point, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you look at Metroid, those games did not sell. They didn't. No one bought them. You know, they can Metroid's be classics. Not a big in general. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. they can be classics now, but no one bought them at the time, so they didn't make it for 20 years. And then everyone whined, Where's Metroid? Where's Metroid? I don't know. You didn't buy it, so they stopped making it. You know what? Like, people will complain, Oh, I hate the MCU. I hate all these Marvel stuff. And then the MCU, every movie they make is a billion dollar movie, so they keep making yep. it. So you have to, if you want to affect change, you have to do this stuff. And I know that's shitty, right? That sucks. No one wants to be told you have to spend this money. But I think if you're going to be an active part of this industry, 
or you have to not it. spend this money depending on right. what your want is exactly yeah. or right or if you don't have the money to spend too like so you may you may want you may advocate for single player games like guardians but you may not necessarily be able to afford guardians when it comes out which is fair sure. because a lot of the games of the service games can be played completely free true so you're if that's the, if you really love gaming and you wish that there were <clears> other <throat> games doing this but you don't have the means now i mean i think that that's a very different conversation than what we're having but it's a fair point to look at is that part of the reason that games as a service and all these things are going the way they are is because a lot of the games that are pushing these things forward are completely free to play mm. yeah it's just there needs i think in an industry like that like this one where if if you want to see Stuff is decided by numbers. We can pretend that these companies care. We can pretend all this stuff that Sony just really wants to see God of War be awesome, right? No, they don't. They're making God of War awesome because that's why 18 million people will buy it. Or 19.5, I think, was the number. If it's not good, that's not going to happen, right? Chris, can I ask you something real quick? Go ahead. Is there a dog or a cat in the room with you? Um, probably. Yeah, there's a dog in the room. Mickey, come okay. here. You're about to get haunted, boy. I was gonna say it's like that. It's like those pictures you posted. I was like, I was like, oh, I didn't realize you were taking a picture or something until I saw the background. He was like, what, dude? I saw something moving in the background, and I was like, what? <laughs> What's up, Mickey? Show. My dog. Look, Mickey. see if you're on, if you're watching on video, you were getting to see a very cute dog. Look at that. He is. Is a boxer? Is. Uh, he's a muck. boxer mix, maybe. He's a yeah, pretty. He's got muck, boxer and All right, buddy. I, yeah. I saw it on Seth around one. Since I feel like yeah, that sounds good. Mm. All right, Chris. Anyway. I mean, I, I think that's an interesting one. I, I do want to hear what people say as a whole, but I do too. There's, there's a lot of things to come in here, but I yeah. personally do live by that creed, but that's also because I am aware that I am in a position to where I'm lucky enough to make enough money, or at least in this point, spend enough money to get enough rewards points to buy every game yeah. that I want to buy without yeah. having to spend money. Yeah, and that's um, my thing. You know, I've said on this show multiple times that I, I'm not rich by any means, but if I don't like a game, I'll just drop it and move on. Fine. I've spent that money and it's it's gone into the ether. So I get that I come from a point of quote unquote privilege, but I still think this is a very, if you are um, participating in video games to the degree that a lot of people who are listening to this conversation are, you're in a position of privilege. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. It doesn't mean you may not have a a, a hit here or there that slows you down, but more often than not, you're in a position to be able to do. Yeah, right. I, I, I agree. Not living in poverty if you're playing on the PS5. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> At least yeah, you how, how dare the PS5 release <laughs> during a global pandemic? <laughs> Dude, how what would I ever article. review this? Oh my god, I don't know how to review. My a PS5 review is about how it's it's wrong for the, a system to release at a time of economic downturn. <laughs> Insane. And and supply constraints. I don't know. Uh, I, don't, okay. I don't want anyone to listen to this and say that I'm sitting there like pointing at you like you need to buy games. I don't care what you do. I just think that all of Put these your money are, where your mouth is. is. Yeah, these There's are all allocation. right. These are all important factors to getting what you want. And if you don't, if you if you complain about Destiny Two and the monetization, and then all you play is Destiny Two, you're you're the reason that this stuff is sticking around. You know what I mean? And it's the same here. Yeah, and I will say, I want to add one weird thing because I don't think it's an entirely part of the conversation and, and there, but I think there's a part of it that people are worried about. I think a lot of the fears of Game Pass are specifically because of people being afraid, and you can tell by the way that people talk about Game Pass, right, is that it drives games to being microtransaction heavy and being too microtransaction heavy and the microtransactions being very like a lot of money. And who knows? Maybe that does end up being the case. We're still too early to really tell. And Microsoft's at a point where they're going to spend money to either court games that are the type of games we're talking about right now to their service or make them themselves because they know it's what's a draw right now. But in the long run, I think that the, the same thing we're talking about, these the conversation in the industry about games as a service and microtransactions and all these things that people don't like are a big reason that there is a group that's very vocal, regardless how big they are, about the fear of Game Pass leading to games being too designed to be microtransaction funnels. And maybe Halo Infinite will prove to be exactly that. Maybe it won't. It's really hard to tell. Uh, but I think that's part of this conversation. And maybe that does come into money, right? Because there's this part where Game Pass as a $10 a month answer could technically do all this, right? And they can look and be like, well, if, if a game that's very story-driven on Game Pass does really well, then they'll know that that was 
development cost well spent and that whenever they go to make another game, put it on Game Pass, they'll be offered more money because of that. But then there's also the thing of, well, since Game Pass is only $10 a month and people are trying to make the lowest common game that you are... Greed might drive you to make the lowest common game that you can put on that service and make the most money off of that will lead to more of this stuff. I think it's a big part of it. So I'm very interested to hear people's uh, response to this and kind of their thoughts. So I guess just to rephrase the question, the community's take this week, uh, Chris, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be, do you, I think we're going to turn a little bit more, do you feel that there's a duty on yourself to buy games as often as possible that fit within the things that you like and break against the molds of the things that you, uh, that you decry. Mm -hmm. So that will be really interesting to see, but thank you guys for joining us. I think that we are, we are done here with episode two thirty six. Don't you dare. (laughs) Don't you dare with me right now. Two (laughs) thirty. No, uh, thanks guys for joining us though. Chris, of course, thanks for joining me. Saul, as usual, Uh, we're going to have a good time with, uh, Chris, one of these days you're going to have to come be part of bro time. You record the episode in person and and then you get to hang out and watch us play Yu-Gi-Oh and be vastly confused at what you don't understand about modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Like I said, I got my giant deck over here. Look, Andrew off screen over here just said that you can catch them hands. I just want you to know that. Look at this. You Look are at all getting these. you are Look getting these. threats, man. What do I do? He's saying he'll bring his gun. Don't worry. You're Yu-Gi-Oh rich over here with your 122 cards. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna cast <laughs> Toon Summon Skull. And hey, he's, he's got Toon Summon Skull, Andrew. I have Shiba Warrior Taro too, a limited edition card. Bruh. it's signed. By who? It's probably the cause re- redone art. <laughs> Yeah, it just says KZ. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cute. It's a little <laughs> shit, but you look at that little guy. It's adorable. Oh, warped. PSA is very warped. Yeah, man. <laughs> shit, was in, shit was in my attic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. As always, Thank remember you, you can be part of the community's take by going over, like we said, to Triangle at Triangle SQRD, going over to Facebook, joining that group, Triangle Squared, a PlayStation podcast, jumping into the Discord by hopping into the link below in the description of either the podcast service that you're listening on or YouTube that you're watching on. And for all of you who go over to patreon.com slash nartech and give us as little as a dollar per month, many of you give us more and we are ever so thankful. Uh, big shout out to you guys. You know that you get a shout out at the end of episode, end of every episode for being part of the reason that this show gets to continue happening. So without further ado, shout out to Ham and Dagger, Bailey Robertson, Rob Warpoint, Josh Drago, Mark Schutz, Cypher Primus, Kyle Grimm, Richard Schaefer, Rude Days 93, Joshua Lago, Landis, Zachary Sawyer, Kevin Bacon Bits, Luke Rabbit, Danny Villiobos, Jehudi MD, Sean, Derek Porter, Corey Hickerson, Constantly Kenny, Matthew Green, Sean Sanderud, The Stonard, Stephen Salazar, Shadowist, and my name is Dan. Thank you all.